wrapping up two very interesting days, reflecting what is the sense of what the gene is doing and how this is related to angel and gene network, to relate our work to the work of policymakers in global education and to look for the future. That's what we want to do together with you for the next minutes. And my name is Annette Schoenflug, as you already know, and I handle over to Liam Regiman, the direct director of GENE. Uh, thank you, Annette, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, and we'll come to thanks to our hosts in, in a little while. But just in case you don't know us, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about GENE. So GENE, Global Education Network Europe, we are the network of ministries and agencies uh, we bring together policymakers from European countries that have national responsibility for global education, development education, awareness raising. Um, and we bring them together with the European Commission uh, with one simple purpose, to increase and improve global education uh, throughout Europe. We do this through policy networking. We also engage in peer review and we do a little bit of policy research ourselves. You may have come across the State of Global Education, uh, which, we, which we produce annually. And we work towards the day when all people in Europe, in solidarity with peoples globally, will have access to quality global education. Now, you might ask yourself, why is he telling us this? And what has that got to do with global education research? Well, some years ago, Jean, together with her colleagues in Bamberg, in Oulu, and in the Institute of Education, the Development Education Research Centre at University College London, uh, we developed a little dream that perhaps we could put together and co-fund and co-found a network of researchers in global education and learning. 20 years previously, this would not have been possible because there weren't enough of them. There weren't enough of you, there weren't enough of us. We didn't have enough uh, researchers in global education to form a network. Uh, we would hardly have formed uh, a dinner party. But, um, but now as the field has emerged in terms of research and within educational research and other policy research fields, uh, we believed that it was necessary to create an independent research network, not only for the cause of researchers, but also for the interest of policymakers, so that policymakers could draw on the best research and also support research in global education, while researchers might take account of the concerns of policymakers in considering research agendas. Annette. Yes, and that's the reason why we did together do, and with our colleagues and supported by all our colleagues from Uru, this conference. And if, you, if we reflect these two days with two big panel discussions with different sessions, with a lot of presenters, then I would like now to wrap up which are the issues emerging from research from these conferences. First, it was very obvious and already starting with our first very rich panel discussion that it's an importance to deepen the discourse and to reflect on the philosophical basis and biases of global education and of the limitations of our thinking and the field. And this is, of course, very much was discussed as well in the session on decolonization, for example. And it is a challenge to early career researchers to go beyond the beyond of the limitations of our thinking in the field. And I think we have seen a lot of very good examples during the last days. It em emerged from our discussions that conceptualizations, typologies, and frames of understanding of the local, the global, the global, 
and of decolonization and some more terms are very important. And we see and we acknowledge from the research from very different corners of our world, we have had participants from Asia, from Indonesia, from Japan, from Australia, from Af different countries of Africa, from Canada, from a lot of countries in Europe. And of course, all these conceptualizations change from which is your standpoint, where you're doing, and from where you are reflecting. And the third aspect is that we need research on political contexts, from global threats to the rise of nationalism, and from context, very specific contexts in very specific situations. We need to reflect the relations between overlapping traditions within the global education umbrella. So development education, education for sustainable development, human rights education, anti-racist education, cosmopolitan education. And of course, the different forms of global understandings of global, and global learning practice and policies need to be reflected. Global education research comes in a variety of settings and sectors, and we had some very nice example from, for example, non-formal sectors, informal education, civil society, school, higher education, and so on. We need to reflect interrogating practice on pedagogy of global education, or what we had in our one of the last presentation, shaking reflections, moving from more and better to the beginnings of meta-analysis, meta-analysis, and I think a lot of case studies can contribute to meta-analysis as there are more and more as there's more and more research done. And of course, policy analysis and critical policy analysis. Uh, aspects which I see as very important. And from all these different fields, we had had examples of very good, inspiring, and important research. And of course, there is the need of more research, and this may be, um, it may be inspired by the issues emerging from European global education policy makers Liam will talk about. Thank you, Annette. And uh, so this is our question. What are the issues that we've explored uh, over the last two days and that, are, uh, that early career researchers are passionate about? Uh, how do they correspond to the issues that European policymakers identify as being crucial to the increase and improvement of global education? And you might be surprised um, when European policymakers get together, as they do in our gene roundtables twice a year, they identify issues that are of concern to them at national level and that they, they uh, require some research or some policy learning uh, or some cross-border sharing of strategies. And so there are some perennial issues that, um, that come up time and again. And these include issues around conceptualization, you can't develop a decent national policy or strategy if you're not fairly clear about what you're talking about. Uh, they have concerns around the political and the policy contexts and about how to deal with a plethora of issues around the contexts, issues which I think have also been reflected these last two days. Um, they need thinking about national strategy developing development processes. And that's everything from the, the sectoral approaches uh, to the nature of the processes to stakeholder engagement, issues that are also of concern to researchers, I believe. They deal with sector-wide and sector-specific strategies, um, and as, as you have done over the last two days. Evaluation is always of interest to policymakers, as is research, how to ensure in an emerging interdisciplinary and interministerial, from a policymaker's point of view, interministerial area, how to ensure that there's a strong evidence base 
is a, a constant concern. And then, of course, uh, I'm sure this is a concern that early career researchers don't care about at all, uh, which is how to achieve adequate levels of funding. Sorry, that was a joke. I'm just checking that you're all still awake. Um, but as I can't see your faces, I'm not sure whether or not you got that. So these are some of the perennial issues that glo global education policy makers uh, face and identify. And then more recently, uh, there have been some more current challenges identified in our recent uh, roundtable a few weeks ago. And they include how to turn the current challenges into opportunities, questions about what kind of normality do we want to return to, um, real questions ar around the questions that were dealt with this morning uh, in that challenging first, uh, first session uh, chaired by Joffe, um, questions around new nationalisms and the threat to democracy, but also uh, very specific and immediate concerns around inequity and inequalities as, uh, as, uh, as school systems and university systems move to the virtual. And there are also uh, concerns and challenges around public recognition of the global and justice solidarity perspectives, and also increased confidence in the role of policymakers and in the need for research-based policies. So these are some of the issues that I believe overlap. And I might just say something uh, momentary about this overlap, because in Gene, we're fairly, um, we're fairly sure that, that uh, academic rigor, intellectual freedom, the nature and independence of universities should insist that the task of identifying research priorities in global education lies not with policymakers, but first and foremost with researchers. Nevertheless, we're also clear that there are overlapping and joint concerns, that there are issues of common interest, that there are common and also uncommon and critically reflected values and aspirations and desires, and that there is a policymaker need for research and I suspect a researcher need to have a real world effect. So the possibility of a common cause. Annette. And if we reflect on our research and if we reflect on, on what to do in the future, I think it is very, very important not to, get, not to forget why we are doing this. We are doing this because we are imagining a very different future. We are imagining a future of global social justice. And I would like to come back to our very first speaker yesterday morning, Professor Ritz V from Australia. He made us reflecting that global education research requires criticality, being critical by making distinction and reflect on that, by the imagination of a new future, by the empathy with other persons from other contexts, contact, content, con, from other backgrounds, by being empathy from people with, from coming from other regions, by not forgetting historicity, where we are coming from, and what is the backpack we are taking with us on black moments in our history. And, and this is, he was emphasizing in a very important way to understand the complexity of the world today. So we imagine and we work on global learning because we want, we are imagining futures by reflecting with these aspects and global education by this is contributing to the future of all of us and to the future of the planet. Liam? Thank you and Annette and reflecting on reflecting on that uh, 
possibility for futures. I was struck yesterday afternoon when in the closing session, um, Massimiliano uh, talked about the need for innovation and about the challenge to be revolutionary. Um, and I think that, that um, the, this brought me back to a comment by the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur, uh, because he suggests that if a tradition is to remain living, then it will only do so if it continues in a critical relationship with innovation. Uh, but he suggests that, uh, that innovation isn't just about the radically new, but it also is about looking back, about looking at the arrows of futurity that are contained within our historical traditions. In global education, we have a very short historical tradition, 40, 50 years. Um, but we build on other traditions of education for social change, education for justice, education for human rights that are far deeper and longer in human history. And the, uh, the recur would perhaps suggest to us, his reflections would perhaps suggest to us that not only do we need to uh, look forward, but we also need to look back and not to, not to reject or neglect the traditions that have been formed, but instead to interrogate them critically and to ensure that we bring the best as we leave uh, the worst behind. Um, Annette. The role I have in the moment would have been done by Doug Bourne, Professor Doug Bourne from the Institute of Education in London if he would have not been ill today. And so I take first the possibility to greet him from all of us and to wish him all the best and to thank him for his support of this conference as well. And secondly, I would like to draw your attention on the fact that there is now from edited by Doug Bourne, the new handbook of global learning. Wait a moment, I'm coming back. Look, here it is, the handbook of global learning, where a lot of summary, summaries are written on the state of research in this field. And I, you, you may be interested in having a look on it. And as we are coming to the end of this conference, I would really very, very, very much thank our colleagues in Ulu for this wonderful opportunity. And please, could you just make your video camera on that we can just clap for you? Clap for, and Elena, can we see you that we clap for you especially? Where is she? Yes. So thank you very much for what you have been doing for us. And thank you very much for the whole team of University Uli, Ulu of such a wonderful, inspiring conference, which brought new ideas to everybody of us and shaped our understanding of global education in a very important way. And I would like to thank the Institute of, Ed of Education in London and the Angel Network and Jean for their support and for the fact that they did together this very inspiring conference. And of course, as you know, as I said already yesterday, the European Commission, which was funding through Jean and Angel this conference. So thank you very much for this funding. Funding is everything, every, every time very important. And of course, a conference is nothing about very dedicated participants and very dedicated chairs, researchers, moderators, and people who are discussing. So I, the, I give a very, very big thank to all of you being who have been doing and making this conference together. So thanks to all of you. <laughs>